Welcome to another one of our vlogs about why answers are not always the answer. So, in this vlog, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we consider how the mind works. Because I think it's an area, I mean, certainly of my 30-year career, it's an area of misunderstanding. And I think it's something that's come to the fore very recently with the advancements and the understanding of behavioral economics. So, because of the increase in understanding about what we do, we are aware there's a lot that goes on in our mind that is beneath the level, the level of conscious awareness. But this is a huge challenge for research because it means that self-report can't tell us stuff because there's stuff that we can't actually report. But the thing is, if people don't know it, they can't tell you. Most people now know about System 1 and System 2. System 1 being fast and intuitive, and System 2 being reasoned and deliberative and conscious and associated more with awareness. But I've come across a lot of stuff where this is confounded with some old views of what the mind is like. So let's have a look at the legacy view of how people think about how the mind works. So, most of what comes out when you talk to people about something that's to do with unconscious has a lot to do with the legacy view of this gentleman, Sigmund Freud. Now, Sigmund was a great staging post in the development of the discipline of psychology. However, he was very, very wrong because his view was we had a conscious mind that would look at something and see it and see it for what it was, in re you know, literally, but we also had this subconscious and this subconscious would look at something and it would interpret it as being something different. And this subconscious would drive our behavior and drive how we feel without us being aware. In effect, what he was describing was a brain within a brain. A brain that could see, think, understand, reason, feel, and do all the things our normal brain does. But of course, we've done a lot of neuroscience now. We know that is simply not the case. And it's just not true. And even though we have these lovely ideas of people being motivated by something that they can't quite control, it's just not true. So this kind of idea of deep emotion connection, and that's a lot spoken about within the world of sort of marketing and advertising, it's just not true. Because it's based on a false premise. So let's get rid of old Sigmund. And how can we describe the brain differently. Well, I was talking to a professor friend of mine a few years ago and we were sort of talking about this problem and trying to explain to people about how the brain works. So we've got to think about it in terms of behavior. We've got to think about it in terms of a metaphor that people can access. And we've got to think about it in a way that is sort of a, a reasonable and sort of engaging way to talk about. And we came up with Hannibal. Bear with me on this. So most people know Hannibal because he was a Carthaginian general. He took on the Roman army. But the, most thing is, the thing he's most famous for is walking elephants across the Alps. Now, most people know that story, but they may not necessarily know why Hannibal had elephants in the first place. Well, what you find, they weren't just to carry things. They were actually part of his army because every good army has a terror weapon. And the elephants were Hannibal's terror weapon. And if you look this up, you can see there are some wonderful pictures of these kind of battling elephants with big castles on the back, and they look terribly intimidating, and they're kind of majestic. But this is a completely false and very glorified view of what actually went on. And what actually went on is much less glorious and much less pleasant. Um, it was much more like, I mean, this is a picture of a 16th century elephant battle dress, but it was more like this. They were sort of, there was one rider, maybe somebody else on the back, and they'd sort of charge at the enemy, and they'd sort of try and scatter them, and then the infantry would go in afterwards. But even then, that was quite tricky, because elephants aren't stupid. Elephants are not going to naturally run at a lot of people shouting, with big spears who were throwing things at them, they are going to be very reasonably and very normally 
wild animals that run away from danger. And this is actually what happened, that a lot of the time it was very hard to get the elephants to charge at the enemy. So how did they get around it? Well, they came up with this very uningenious solution of mixing a lot of wine with a lot of fruit juice and getting the elephants drunk. I told you it wasn't very glorious. Anyway, so with these kind of drunk elephants, what would happen is they'd get the elephants really very drunk indeed. They'd put the rider on top who'd have a big stick and he would try and steer them from one way to another. Quite often it wouldn't work. They could sort of charge and then they'd shoot off in the wrong direction. Quite often they'd turn around and trample back over their own side. But on the balance, most of the time, they were threatening enough that they didn't have to charge. Or if they did, enough of them went into the army to cause enough, enough of a problem. But it still wasn't a very reliable way. And this idea of the rider and the elephant is one that sort of stuck with me and my professor friend. And we sort of said, well, maybe that's a good way to describe to people how the mind works. Maybe think of like system two, this conscious, conscious reason bit, being like the rider on the elephant. He can be in control, he can move it around to an extent, and he sometimes can get it to do what it wants to do. But underneath, we have this unconscious drunk elephant. And quite frankly, sometimes, depending on context, depending on what's happened before, depending on any number of reasons, if you look up heuristics, you see all the reasons why this happens. There's always an occasion when it can charge off in the wrong direction and there's not much we can do about it. And we lose the sense of being able to actually be in control of what we do. And it's a very scary way to think about ourselves, but it is actually very common that no matter on, you know, to a level of scale, of course, there are some good things that happen and some bad things that happen. There are things, extreme things that happen and very gentle things that happen. But quite a lot of the time, actually, we spend our lives riding along on this drunk elephant. And whether we like it or not, now and again, we just get dragged off to go and do something silly. And we look back and go, why did we do that? Or quite often we don't. We actually justify ourselves and say, oh, yeah, and post, post, post rationalize it. So it's an uncomfortable truth, but it's something that we know a lot about. So in all of this, there's been a lot of understanding in the world of research as to, try, as, as, to, as to how to try and understand the black box, to try and understand what's going on underneath and in here. But actually what we really need to do is think about measuring behavior, because a behavior is the culmination of all mental processes. And if we can simulate situations and get people to behave in them, then you can start to get a more better answers and start to be able to predict what people are going to do far better. This is why at in the Room we use augmented reality and virtual reality to get people to simulate experiences and then understand how they predict from that point onwards. Please visit our website to find out more and thank you very much for listening.